Hello, everyone. Sorry for waking you up. Um, we just had the open space. I hope some people enjoyed or just walked around or had a beer or something. Uh, you hear me. Yes. There's a bar downstairs. You, you can go there and have a beer. Well, if you didn't know about it, <laughs> now you know. There is a bar? Yeah. <laughs> but we're going to have beers afterwards. Uh, <laughs> So you were just in Belgium. Do not complain about beer. So okay. Sure uh, <laughs> and after this, we were supposed to have a 15-minute break, but we decided to make a five-minute break, go directly for the closing keynote, and then have beers instead of extending the time and having less time for beer in the end. So more beer, better. Yep. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, now, please give a warm welcome to Sahat. He came all the way from Turkey, but he, in the end, he was in Ghent now, so it's not that far. <laughs> so, but please, welcome to Hat. Thank you, Tego. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, so my name is Sarhat. Um, I work at Atlassian, Obscene team specifically. So I've been working with the Obscene team for two years. Atlassian acquired us last year. So for the last year, I, I am working for Atlassian. I'm also an AWS community hero, uh, like Jan, um, but Jan is uh, serverless hero. Um, so, uh, how many of you attended the other uh, two serverless sessions? Okay, many of you. I mean, in, the, in, in this talk, uh, sorry? Okay, in this, in this talk, so we are gonna see a lot of overlaps, because I mean, I'm, I'm also watching these other talks. Uh, and so I will, just going back a little bit. Um, so I was in Ghent yesterday and the previous day. I'm also one of the global co-organizers of DevOps Days events. Um, so I'm also organizing DevOps Days in Istanbul. So um, we have been celebrating the 10th year anniversary of DevOps Days. And as some of you probably know, uh, DevOps name actually came from DevOps Days. So it's a kind of a big deal. Now we can see like there are uh, DevOps engineers with 10 years of experience. Um, it might be a thing now. Um, so, and in this conference also there were a lot of people uh, coming from serverless area, area as well, uh, a lot of other AWS serverless heroes as well. Uh, so we can see like how DevOps and serverless community overlap, uh, cloud all, like they're all kind of, uh, in, we are all kind of in the same place, in the same area. Uh, so uh, my background to Amsterdam is actually two years now, I guess. Uh, DevOps is Amsterdam, my one of like the, I think it was my first, let's say, big conference. So I was pretty excited to be on the stage, you know, Emily Freeman, Matt Stratton, like uh, all the kind of cool guys were watching. <laughs> so it was very stressful. Um, so, but I, ha I mean, it was one of the best conferences I have ever attended. Um, so let's go back to the actual stuff, serverless stuff. So um, we've been um, doing a lot of things with serverless for the last two years at Ofgini. Um, so this is a gift from Tim Wagner. So he he leads he was leading the uh, serverless division of AWS, and this is his um, uh, he's in destroying some servers uh, three years ago, but uh, there are probably still servers because he is doing it again uh, this year. Um, there are going to be always servers, so I was a bit cautious, and also it might be a code of conduct violation because you know. <laughs> So uh, just being a little bit careful. Um, so who thinks here serverless is kind of a buzzword? Anyone? OK, only a couple of people. It's nice. Uh, so sometimes it is used as a buzzword, but I think it, you know, we passed that uh, threshold now So because a lot of people are actually using serverless on production. Um, but people often use it to describe different things. Uh, so, but I would like to talk about a little bit about why uh, before what. Because it is also it is important that we know what why we are doing these things why we are uh, why we need serverless. We've seen uh, like the reasoning behind serverless in the other presentations as well. But I want to go over uh, go over on some 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 things. So the, I think the main reason is there is great inefficiency in how we operate software today, how we run software today, and uh, I can group them under three things. So there. Are a lot of like idle computing resources we, you, you don't use. It's just wasted. It's just uh, being there and we are not le using it. And also developer productivity is still uh, a question. But I think serverless still has you know uh, a lot to improve in that sense. 
it is not uh, sold yet, but it is marketed as, you know, uh, kind of it makes you faster. In a way, it makes you faster on production when you go to production, but before going to production, there are some things that uh, serverless tools can make better. Uh, this has been my experience at least. And also a lot of chores. We do a lot of things like uh, scaling, for example, uh, for our applications, right? We mostly have EC2 machines on production for Obscene, so I'm going to talk about uh, what Obscene is a, a little bit to make sure like you understand how critical our application is. Uh, we do a lot of chores. We do like uh, even like sending your logs is a lot of work. Um, so a lot of things that we shouldn't probably focusing on that you know that are not directly bringing benefits to our customers, but we have to do like scaling our instances and all. So um, I would like to talk a little bit about our journey and give you a background. So Obscene is an on-call and incident management solution for operating always on services, um, that as we as we say it, which means. Um, when our customers are down, we are helping them uh, with, you know, fastening their instant response, uh, sending them alerts. Alerts. Uh, we have escalation, so we make sure that, you know, someone actually taking care of the alert, which means uh, we have to be up and running all the time. Uh, we are going to help our customers when they have downtime, right? So this is kind of, you know, when we introduce a new service into our system, we, we are really being careful. Uh, so our approach, and this has uh, been working quite well for us, we have um, over five nines availability. Uh, so we are, since the beginning, since 2012, our approach has been uh, just if there is a managed service on AWS, let's use it. I mean, let's not manage it, let's outsource it. AWS has, you know, tens of years of experience uh, running these services. So let's use serverless, what they call serverless or managed services as much as possible. Uh, one of the reasons is obviously your time is priceless. I mean, if you're especially a startup, I mean, you have to uh, innovate and also keep your services, especially if you are in a software as a solution service, you have to uh, innovate and also keep your service uh, up and running all the time. Uh, and you cannot have experts in uh, every area. So our engineering team, of Chinese engineering team is in Ankara, for example. And if we are running, let's say, uh, not a Dynamo, but Cassandra, and if we have some problem with Cassandra, how are we going to solve it? It's kind of you know hard to find these kind of experts, but. Uh, in DynamoDB, most things are, for example, all source AWS. We don't care about a lot of things. We still care about a lot of things as well, but a lot of chore works are all source. Um, and also, we just to give a couple of names, we are fully on AWS. We, are, we use various services, DynamoDB, our uh, main data store is DynamoDB. Um, we were, when we started, we were using uh, uh, Aurora. Uh, now we are using DynamoDB. We have slower, but it's for the data uh, analytics side. SQS, Lambda, RDS, um, EC2, ALB, Route 53, Kinesis, SNS, a couple of others as well. Um, so our serverless journey started in 2015. We started writing small scale applications. I think it is, you know, when services are new, especially. 2015 isn't that far, but AWS Lambda has improved a lot since then. So, you know, even the Concurrent execution limit, I'm not sure if you are familiar with it, with it, but can you raise your hand if you are familiar with what concurrent execution limit is? Okay, not a lot of people. So, there, you know, AWS Lambda, uh, in theory, is infinitely scalable, but if you, you know, there is a formula, uh, so I'm not going into the detail, it's on the document, AWS documents, but uh, if you have like certain number of uh, Lambda functions running concurrently, there is a limit. Uh, it depends on the like uh, how many gigabytes uh, you, you use for your functions, and a uh, couple of other things as well. Uh, so, um, so basically, there is a limit, and you are going to get throttled if you reach that limit. Um, so, it is better to just you know that because of most of these limitations, especially if you are running something critical, it is better to start you know small. So, we started um, writing small scale, let's say, custom integrations. Uh, at this point, not even our production environment, you know, helping our customers uh, integrate with our product. Uh, most of our customers at the time also were using uh, AWS. So we helped them integrate through AWS Lambda. And in most cases, it's integrations, things like, for example, there is an alert, you know, trigger the Lambda function, do something, and it's done. And in this case, you know, it's also, uh, from a pricing perspective, it's also the best option because, I mean, how many alerts do, do you get? Like, uh, hopefully <laughs> not a lot, but how many alerts do you get usually? Uh, I mean, sometimes you get a lot, sometimes you don't. So uh, this is the perfect use case. So um, 
we we usually again try to like um, try to use many services, and AWS Lambda seems very promising. So we started uh, we decided to use you know even further and use it on production. So um, we started using Lambda for mostly let's say asynchronous jobs and uh, what we call not very business critical parts of Opsini. Uh, mostly because you know we read about this concurrent execution limit. Also, there are other limits as well. If you use with API Gateway, for example, uh, you only have like 30 seconds uh, response time. Uh, these are things that we didn't want to have. Uh, so we started small, um, integrating with other tools like DynamoDB. We are going to see some examples later. So we go even further, you know, just trying and trying. Then in 2017, we decided to create this new uh, feature that we have called service and incident management using running uh, fully on AWS Lambda integrated with the rest of the codeways. So we can, you know, uh, there are some parts of this uh, feature that are triggered uh, by our EC2 from our EC2 uh, applications from our EC2 machines. Also like some customer facing um, parts of it uh, using API Gateway as well. Uh, so back at the time, oops. Yeah, back at the time, there weren't a lot of uh, tools that is supporting uh, this uh, new environment. Uh, there, we were using New Relic uh, at the time, but you know it also didn't work out uh, in AWS Lambda. Um, there were not many tools out there, so we did uh, create, we did uh, write a let's say monitoring uh, library inside, and it it became a, a separate product, and you know when at last Unicode Opsini. It was a sp spin-off, so it is now in a separate company called Tundra. They are doing uh, serverless observability, but they born uh, out of Opsini all uh, because of our needs to monitor our applications. But back at the time, we couldn't do it. I mean, if we were to run something on production, we needed uh, really good monitoring. We needed to know. We, we, we do like very like we uh, log pretty much <laughs> everything just to make sure we know at least we have something if in case something happens we know like we can figure out what is wrong somehow. Um, so there are four uh, key takeaways plus, uh, plus one uh, that I would like to share. I mean uh, <coughs> the rest of the parts are mostly our experience and also you will you saw a couple of these points in other presentations as well because they're true. So, uh, the first one is serverless does not remove the need for great engineers. Sometimes, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, sometimes, uh, you know, we are out of jobs with serverless thing. Oh, definitely not. I mean, uh, this is from uh, Jan's presentation. I use this all the time. Uh, I mean, it's so complex, you, you don't even know where to start. Uh, and it usually looks like this after like you have 10, 20 functions, whatever. I mean, you are not just using AWS Lambda. I mean, to to use like to leverage the full power of uh, a service like AWS Lambda, you also need to use other uh, what what they call serverless services like DynamoDB, SQS. Uh, that is the only way. I mean, it's, it's otherwise it's going to be a lot of problems. And there is a steep, I think, learning curve still for going fully serverless. I mean, it is really simple to publish your first function. Uh, you know, just write something, implement an interface, write something, wrap it, and you know, in a zip file, upload it. It's it works quite well for simple projects. But when you want to do something real, um, something big, um, you kind of have to know, uh, have to learn a lot of other things as well. It's not easy. So what once you you know cross that certain threshold, it it gets a lot easier, and you you are more productive. And also uh, serverless kind of forces you to use right microservices if you are doing something serious and it has many benefits I don't I, I don't disagree I mean microservices has many benefits but also it is uh, hard to get in I mean it is hard to uh, do it on production properly uh, with lambda I mean it's it's also not easy it's and also I mean if you are a startup for example probably you don't need that kind of complexity you, you probably don't have a lot of customers at the moment uh, but again, uh, if you know certain best practices, uh, this this may not be as hard as you know uh, for others. Maybe if you have like some so, some sort of like existing project and you want to migrate it, probably it's harder. So uh, a couple of things about this. So you have to think event driven. Um, so I mean, if you are let's say triggering a function, and if you have like five different functions calling each other, and if it's all synchronous, <laughs> I mean your functions can you know throw a timeout. If there's something broken in between, 
uh, so it can lead uh, to like latency, whatever. So it is, you have to think about uh, the event-driven nature of Lambda. And uh, uh, Jan mentioned it as well. Uh, you have to figure out how functions communicate with each other. There are a lot of different ways that functions can communicate. You, you can use AWS Lambda SDK, SQS, SNS. We use SNS, for example, for a lot of things. We also use SQS uh, or KCL. There are a lot of options. And um, your function has to be stateless. I mean, we've seen, we've, we have heard about this as well. So, uh, again, like, there are some people probably like trying to keep the state, uh, but you know, caching uh, is useful, especially like if you are using a kind of like our tool like RDS, if you have a connection pool, for example, it takes some time to uh, initiate those connection pools. So you can cache, but you don't know if it's gonna, you know, next time you, you make a request to Lambda, you don't know if it's gonna be there or not. So you have to think twice, uh, stateless, and uh, you have to uh, make sure that your, you know, important data is persisted every time. Um, and also, obviously, milliseconds matter. It's not just, you know, even just a couple of uh, simple improvements can, uh, can, ma can make some money. So it's, it means money. Uh, so certain things that probably we don't care, but we may start caring with something like AWS Lambda. So uh, that is why we still need great engineers to build these microservice architectures, complex architectures uh, that also think about pricing of uh, pricing, pricing as aspect of it. Um, so the second takeaway is uh, that serverless is definitely not a no ops. Uh, that is obviously not a thing, uh, but it is less ops. We still outsource a lot of things to AWS. So uh, now I would like to give you an example. Uh, so this happened, this is an uh, old incident. Uh, it happened like three years ago. Uh, so we had this uh, architecture back at the time there was no SQS trigger. Uh, so this was uh, in a development environment. So um, we didn't really have uh, alerting for this. Uh, so one of my friends from Turkey actually knows about this and he let me know you're spending too much money, you know. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we didn't know. Uh, so um, we had this um, function called incident monitor log. What, what it does is uh, it is writing logs to uh, our gray log instance and gray log is down, we don't know it. So it is trying to, you know, uh, make the request for five minutes, and it was five minutes, you know, the maximum uh, execution time back at the time is 15 now. So it's trying, 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 it fails, and it goes to the um, dead letter queue, uh, and there's another Lambda function pulling the dead letter queue, and uh, getting the payload again, and running the incident monitor log to log to, uh, log, log, uh, to write the logs to the gray log, to gray log. Obviously, it is consuming all the concurrent execution limit, uh, practically running with full capacity all the time for two weeks. <laughs> and, and the result is combined with cloud watch logs and you know, everything is uh, $4,000, $40,000. Uh, but AWS paid back the, uh, almost all the amount, uh, even though they, they didn't have to. I mean, I understand that, I mean, you can see, like if you don't use any CT instance, it is clear, like usage, uh, like you don't use any CPU, whatever, you just forget it, they pay back. But in this case, we actually used it. Um, so there is great danger if you don't know how to properly use uh, AWS Lambda, so you have to be careful. So a couple of lessons learned. Uh, you should definitely avoid instant infinite to tries uh, and set up limits, uh, especially you know uh, when functions communicate each other, this is important. And monitoring and alerting for pricing is important. Make sure that you know if you cross a certain th threshold, uh, make sure that your uh, your engineers are aware of it. Uh, but the thing is, uh, there is still no pricing metric for specific AWS Lambda. Uh, there is an easy uh, way to do this anyway, but uh, it, it would be better if we could just you know uh, alert based on specific pricing. But you can just uh, watch the account and uh, alert an engineer. This is what we do. Um, and another thing is definitely think about CloudWatch logs. Uh, sometimes we talk about like AWS Lambda is, isn't you know, that expensive, it is cheap, but probably it's not the only tool you use. I mean, by default, you are gonna use CloudWatch uh, and also you are gonna use other services as well. So CloudWatch has been uh, the bigger part of that bill. Um, and also 
I recommend sampling logs and metrics uh, because, again, it's going to cost you probably, if you do a lot of monitoring, if it's going to cost you uh, more than even Lambda. Um, so, and also when we talk about less ops, I mean, what I mean is you, s you still need to build your delivery pipeline. Um, you still need some sort of, you know, CI CD tool and deployment strategy. It's easier, you know, there are like, easy ways to uh, deploy your uh, functions. Uh, but still you have to build those. I mean, if also if you are using something like, for example, language like Java or .NET, code start might be an issue, we use Java. So especially back at the time, it was a <laughs> big problem. Uh, we were even like, uh, so we had this, you know, framework, internal and develop framework. Um, it was sometimes even taking like eight seconds, 10 seconds to like when we first hit a function and there is no available container. Uh, so if you know like how Lambda works underneath, so if you make a request and if there is, uh, so underneath it runs on containers, uh, so probably it's more complicated, but you make a request, if there is an available container initiated, it reuses it. If it's available, it reuses it uh, for some time. Uh, you don't know like, exactly when AWS Lambda is gonna uh, destroy all containers or containers, uh, but you know like you deploy something, it's gonna destroy whatever, but uh, you don't know. Uh, and if there is no available uh, container, there is gonna be some time initiating the code, uh, especially with Java, you know, class loading and all, so it's gonna take some time. Um, so there was a uh, huge bottleneck with VPC. If you used VPC back at the time, uh, it could like double the uh, amount of time you spent on the cold start part of it, but it's now uh, gone, so they fixed it. Um, and also, we talk about this, so I, I don't think we need to anyway. Uh, so infinite scale, but not really. So you have to be careful about your strategy, like how are you gonna, how are you gonna handle if you hit that limit somehow. Um, so, and if you hit that limit often maybe, you might want to open up a ticket to AWS and increase your limit. Uh, we did that and they are uh, pretty responsive and in increasing it. Uh, and, you know, also even recommending you like, what can you, what you can do better uh, to better utilize your uh, capacity and all. And also monitoring has to be a first class citizen uh, because, you know, if something happens in your environment, you really, uh, existing tools really don't, doesn't work uh, well. So you have to uh, think about uh, monitoring and uh, especially when you use other services, uh, distributed tracing also becomes important. So uh, just a slide about like uh, why uh, it was hard to monitor Lambda and how do we fix with Tundra. So there were uh, too many moving pieces. Uh, I mean, Again, you're not, you don't just have one EC2 machine and you don't have just one uh, application running. You have multiple functions. You use DynamoDB, you use SNS. So it's all communicating with each other. Uh, so it's, it requires a different mentality on how you approach monitoring. And uh, so there was no way to attach an agent. Um, so normally you, you, when you do like application performance monitoring, with Java, so you pass an you know agent and it does the monitoring, uh, most monitoring from outside, uh, but that wasn't possible because you don't have access to that kind of you know uh, capabilities, right? So it wasn't possible. Um, so we had to find clever ways to uh, do the APM part of it inside the function, and even how to send the monitoring data to your service is a discussion point. So this is still a discussion point, but I think the better approach is, you know, the, let me tell you the reason first. So if normally you send the monitoring data to your, you know, whatever service you use through HTTP request, usually, um, but with Lambda, if you do that, first it's gonna, you know, make your functions, you know, increase your latency. Obviously, it's gonna take some time. Even if it's just a couple of seconds, it's, your monitoring tool might be down. It might also affect your functions availability, which is unacceptable in production. So, uh, but also, uh, it means like if you don't do it, if you, uh, there's another way, uh, it will cost you more. This is cheaper because you are just directly sending to your monitoring data, your monitoring tool, and also it will be faster usually. So we do it, uh, we have two ways, like we do it, uh, we do this, you know, directly sending through HTTP request option to, uh, in development environment. In production, we write all the logs and, you know, all the monitoring data to CloudWatch directly. So it is a lot safer, it's faster, 
but you know then you have to uh, pay for CloudWatch as well. But again, it's safer. So there is another Lambda function uh, listening to those CloudWatch logs and sending those logs to the monitoring tool. So it's safer because your actual function isn't spending any time sending monitoring data, instead writing directly to CloudWatch. So right now, you know, with the layers, uh, Lambda layers, it is very easy to you know add monitoring. It's just one click. You don't even have to add any code to your function. So uh, these things, you know, these improvements make you like makes operations part of it. Um, operations part of Lambda very easy. Um, if you use Lambda on production, I definitely recommend Tundra. They are doing a great job. Um, so the other one is serverless is usually cheaper, and we shouldn't just look at our bill. It is very important. So for for example, I would like to give an example. Uh, so two years ago, because of our high re reliability availability uh, requirements, before uh, so before this you know globe DynamoDB global table was a thing, uh, we were doing uh, cross region replication of our data. So we were basically uh, writing everything to one region, and we are we were uh, replicating to another region. Uh, as a backup, so if we somehow have a failure in a region, we could switch back to this, this region and have all the data available. So uh, what we did is we just wrote uh, like 20 lines of code, uh, replication stream is in the Lambda, and uh, this Lambda was listening um, all the DynamoDB tables we have, and we didn't need to do anything. We just, you know, <coughs> attach the trigger and write the code, you know, just Make the request. This makes the request to another region. That's all. We don't even need to care about uh, scaling this. You know, uh, if you use an EC2 machine, we need to think about like uh, if there are more shards in DynamoDB, a lot more data coming through. Uh, you have to scale your EC2 instances, and also with Lambda, it just works. It's, it scales automatically per shard. So a lot of things, a lot of uh, concerns are outsourced to. Um, AWS. So in this case, we save uh, a lot of time. So it means a lot of engineering force, right? Um, and also, you just you know monitoring is also easy. In this case, it's just 20 lines of code. Uh, write the important parts with log. Uh, so so you have basic monitoring as well, just in case something happens. Uh, couple of other things. Uh, if you have like a couple of Lambda functions doing some things uh, with operations. It is usually even you know there is even usually no cost. It is usually from the free, free tier. Uh, Hundred millisecond based pricing is usually uh, cheaper if you have you know use it if you use it for things like for example alerting. Uh, finding we talked about this in other um, presentations. Finding good engineers is definitely hard, and keeping them is even harder. So uh, you don't want them to deal with you know all this uh, stuff that doesn't really uh, make you know save say bring you money or make our customers happy. Um, so the total cost of ownership is also cheaper. Uh, there is no initial investment. It is easy to start, but again there is a steep uh, learning learning curve. Uh, overall, less maintenance costs, engineering workforce costs is uh, decreased. And again, you probably are not Spotify or Netflix. Uh, when you reach that scale, I mean, you can review and see maybe like uh, how we can decrease these costs. They do that. I mean, uh, we hear a lot of great stuff from Netflix, but uh, for example, they do keep their uh, data in their uh, part of their data in their infrastructure uh, to save some money. This, when you reach ca that kind of scale, you start thinking about those concerns. But uh, if, if you are just starting, if you have you know, some workload, if you don't have millions of users, uh, you know, spending time on these things probably aren't going to uh, be useful for you. Uh, so sometimes we hear this, you know, serverless is just you know, uh, connecting, uh, like listening DynamoDB streams is a good use case, sure. I'm going to show you examples. But it's not just for a couple of use cases. You can do a lot of things with AWS Lambda. Um, so one uh, simple example, uh, just you know how we integrate with customers. Uh, for example, I wrote this uh, application. It's a simple one, just you know, a couple of lines of code Slack, uh, for Slack. Um, so there is a message in Slack, let's say, and uh, there is an outgoing webhook, which means if we write something on Slack, Slack will uh, trigger an endpoint with the payload, with the message payload. And we can have an API endpoint using API gateway, and we receive the payload, you know, send the payload to Lambda function. From the Lambda function, we know, like, the select message, who sent it. So we can do, like, enrichment. We can go ahead and, you know, retrieve additional 
uh, things, you know, get approval, whatever, or just, you know, create the alert. Uh, so this is a uh, frequently used filter, filtering or enriching data use case. Uh, we do like offer a lot of capabilities uh, by default, but sometimes customers have some specific needs. Uh, so this is also a pretty valid use case. So another one uh, is you know, this changed uh, a bit, but uh, the overall use case is still similar. So we do scale our DynamoDB tables our own. There are some reasons. For example, you can downscale your uh, tables, decrease their read and write capacity like four times a day. So you have to be a little bit smarter. Um, so we, we, we have this, you know, we wrote this on our own. Um, so just, you know, to talk about a couple of important Lambda functions, we, um, we have, so we have auto scale Lambda. Basically, if there is a request, what it does is it does, it goes to the related table and update the capacity. And you can trigger this one uh, through uh, the config table. So we keep all the DynamoDB uh, table configs, like what is maximum read capacity, minimum read capacity. So we have this, you know, a uh, couple of uh, data points that we keep. So we keep this in this uh, table. And if we update this, it will trigger an auto-scale lambda will make the necessary change. Um, and there are a couple, couple of ways of, of updating this. Uh, one is if uh, um, there is an, like there is more load going through Dy DynamoDB, and if, we, if there is an alarm, uh, we will uh, check the you know, uh, table state and update it automatically. This is one case, or if you need uh, data migration, let's say you are like migrating your data, uh, to another table, and if you need to increase capacity on purpose, uh, you can do it through uh, this through our simple Slack app and write like uh, the new uh, capacity and send it, um, and it will trigger also this automatically. And in the meantime, also once you auto scale a, a DynamoDB table, and also this will trigger another Lambda function to update the <coughs> alarm as well so that we don't get false alarms. Also, it is aligned with the existing DynamoDB table um, metrics. So uh, this is the uh, example of uh, the bigger application, service and incident management feature. Uh, we, most of our functions, so we had like service domain functions, incident domain functions, uh, and they are talking with each other using uh, SNS. And um, again, these are mi the minority part. I mean, most of the functions are called through from EC2 machines in this case. So we created like easy to use Java SDKs for our development development teams. So if they, s they want to trigger a Lambda function or this feature, obviously they don't know it's a Lambda function. They just, you know, uh, they have this, you know, a, a easy to use, let's say, frame uh, SDK, and they just call, uh, create a, create something in, uh, create a service, let's say, uh, say, or just delete a service, whatever, and it will trigger a Lambda function internally. Um, so it will, by the way, it will not directly trigger, it will send a message to a, a SNS topic, and from that SNS topic, we will do the rest. Uh, also, we had API gateway, but uh, we got rid of it after some time, you know, because of some limitations that, you know, we couldn't just live. And also it's expensive. <laughs> I mean, API Gateway is, uh, is very capable. Uh, and also, a, a lot of AWS folks started recommending, like, if you are just getting uh, the payload, and if you are just passing the payload uh, to the Lambda function, ALB is a, might be a better option, so take a look at that as well. It is usually cheaper and easier to use. In this case, API Gateway might be hard to maintain, uh, the, especially the templates. Uh, so ARLB is a good uh, alternative. Uh, so take a look at that one. Um, so again, a couple of things. Uh, again, fa Functions and Service AWS Sunday is amazing for connecting stuff, that is for sure. Uh, but if it's, it, it's something event-driven, obviously you can do it easily. Um, also, AW, uh, API Gateway has WebSocket now, so maybe it's more than that. Uh, and also, there's support for bringing your own language. Uh, there are like Java, Node.js, Python, C Sharp. Uh, there are a lot of options right now built in. But if you still need to use like uh, a language like PHP, for example, uh, there are again like easy to use open source projects that you can you can uh, you can use them, or you can just 
build uh, integrate your own language and uh, use it easily. So um, it is for all languages now. Um, and also, I mean, we, we talk about some other other speakers also, also talked about this again. The goal is not to use serverless. Sometimes you tend to use, I mean, a Lambda is, is a cool service, but if, let's say, there's a transcribe service over there, there's an event glitch over there, like there is, there are other many services that does, you know, most of these specific things. If there is a better alternative, there is a better service doing all these things for you, you know, it's it's not about Lambda, so maybe just take a look at other services. Sometimes you miss, I mean, I probably have like, uh, ten, AWS probably has like 10 different services that I have never heard about. It's okay, <laughs> uh, but maybe take a look at if there is a better alternative uh, managed service offered by AWS in this case. Um, and also there are like other commonly used um, use cases. We have we use Lambda for ETL jobs as well. You can build APIs, mobile applications, web applications, stream processing applications. Uh, the use cases are limitless usually. So uh, Jan uh, talked about this pretty well. I mean, uh, he explained this, why vendor lock-in lock -in is often a myth. So I think like if you are a government, obviously, uh, you might want to be a little bit careful about you know selecting a cloud provider or depending your critical services uh, for I mean on cloud provider we've seen examples governments can you know uh, have a conflict and ju just shut down uh, services you know uh, I will not name any company but we've seen this happen just recently uh, a couple of times uh, so if you are running something very critical for your country whatever maybe cloud is not a good option but if you are a startup, if you are a, let's say, mid-sized company, uh, if you are not huge, like for example, companies like Siemens, even they are going AWS, but for them, this might be a concern. They might have to think about uh, hybrid approaches, whatever, because they have customers that have these concerns. But if you are a startup, if you have a product, uh, I, I think it's just a uh, waste of time and money. Um, also, this is, there's a great cartoon about this. You can, you know, be that in technical depth if you <laughs> just trying to uh, avoid cloud locking. Uh, so uh, let's wrap up. So uh, there are, I think, five things. Uh, first, you still need great engineers. Serverless is not going to remove the need for great engineers. It is less ops. There is still need for operations. Uh, build your CI CD pipeline. Still build your monitoring. Uh, around Lambda or other you know, serverless tools as well. Um, also, even config management or alerting, those are still valid concerns. Uh, it is cheaper usually because don't, do not just think about the cost of the function. Um, and also, you can achieve many use cases with Lambda. And when they're looking, probably, you know, it's not a concern for many of us here. Uh, so again, I would like to uh, say these things because they are important. Customers do not care. I mean, our customers have no idea if we are running like some part of our infrastructure on AWS, some that they do not care if you're running containers, whatever. They care if our solution helps them. They care if we deliver the you know, feature, we, if we keep our feature velocity, if we you know, fix boxes on time, if we have user-friendly application. These are the things that our customers care. So, um, I mean, AWS Lambda definitely can help, it, tools like AWS Lambda, because we outsource a lot of short things and we focus on delivering business value faster. Uh, but it's, it's, it might have a steep learning curve. Uh, it might have some problems, but it is, if I have seen this, you know, um, from the, you know, uh, start, we, I mean, it's just crazy, like, how uh, the improvement they made uh, since the beginning. It's just crazy, so it's going to get better and better all the time. Uh, so there is a great, uh, great uh, article about this. I really like this because it also uh, talks about the downsides and also benefits, uh, opportunities of serverless. And there is a great quote. I would like to uh, finish my talk with this. Serverless competing will become the default competing paradigm of the cloud era, according to Berkeley University. So thank you very much. <laughs>